Bridget Bellamont usually lasted till the small hours. And when Lily went to bed that night, she had played too long for her own good. Feeling no desire for the self-communion which awaited her in her room, she lingered on the broad stairway, looking down into the hall below, where the last card players were grouped about the tray of tall glasses and silver-collared decanters, which the butler had just placed on a low table near the fire. There were moments when such scenes delighted Lily, when they gratified her sense of beauty. There were others when they gave a sharper edge to the meagerness of her own opportunities. This was one of the moments when the sense of contrast was uppermost. And she turned away impatiently as Mrs. George Dorset, glittering in serpentine spangles, drew Percy Grice in her wake to a confidential nook beneath the gallery. It was not that Miss Bart was afraid of losing her newly acquired hold over Mr. Grice. Mrs. Dorset might dazzle him, but she had neither the skill nor the practice to effect his capture. And besides, why should she care to give herself the trouble? The mere thought of that other woman who could take a man up and toss him aside as she willed, without having to regard him as a possible factor in her plans, filled Lily Bart with envy. She had been bored all the afternoon by Percy Grice, but she could not ignore him on the morrow. She must follow up her success, must submit to more boredom, must be ready with fresh compliances, and all on the bare chance that he might ultimately decide to do her the honor of boring her for life. <laughs> it was a horrible fate, but how escape from it? What choice had she to be herself or Gertie Farish. She had a vision of Miss Farish's cramped flat with its cheap conveniences and hideous wallpapers. No, she was not made for mean and shabby surroundings. Her whole being dilated in an atmosphere of luxury. It was the only climate she could breathe in, but the luxury of others was not what she wanted. A few years ago, it had sufficed her. Now she was beginning to chafe at the obligations it imposed. There were even moments when she was conscious of having to pay her way. For a long time, she had refused to play bridge. She could not afford it and was afraid of acquiring so expensive a taste. In the last year, she had found that her hostesses expected her at the card table. It was one of the taxes she had to pay for their prolonged hospitality and for the dresses and trinkets which occasionally replenished her insufficient wardrobe. Tonight, the luck had been persistently bad, and the little gold purse was almost empty when she returned to her room. Taking out her jewel case, she looked for the roll of bills from which she had replenished the purse before dinner. Only $20 were left. The discovery was so startling that for a moment she fancied she must have been robbed. And she took paper and pencil and tried to reckon up what she had spent her, robbing with fatigue. But at last it became clear to her that she had lost $300 at cards. It was the sum she had set aside to pacify her dressmaker, unless she should decide to use it as a sop to the jeweler. At any rate, she had so many uses for it that its very insufficiency had caused her to play high in the hope of doubling it. But of course she had lost she who needed every penny, while Bertha Dorset, whose husband showered money on her, must have pocketed at least 500. A world in which some such things could be seemed a miserable place to Lily Bart, but then she had never been able to understand the laws of a universe which was so ready to leave her out of its calculations. She began to undress without ringing for her maid, whom she had sent to bed. She had been long, long enough in bondage to other people's pleasure to be considerate of those who depended on hers. And in her bitter moods, it sometimes struck her that she and her maid were in the same position, except that the latter received her wages more regularly. As she sat before the mirror brushing her hair, her face looked hollow and pale, and she was frightened by two little lines near her mouth. Oh, I must stop worrying, she exclaimed, unless it's the electric light, she reflected, springing up from her seat and lighting the candles on the dressing table. She turned out the wall lights and peered at herself between the candle flames, 
The white oval of her face swam out waveringly from a background of shadows, the uncertain light blurring it. But the two lines about the mouth remained. Lily rose and undressed in haste. It's only because I am tired and have such odious things to think about, she kept repeating. And it seemed an odd injustice that petty care should leave a trace on the beauty which was her only defense against them. But the odious things were there and remained. She returned wearily to the thought of Percy Grice. She was almost sure she had landed him. A few days' work and she would win her reward. But the reward itself seemed unpalatable just then. It would be a rest from worry, no more. And how little that would have seemed to her a few years earlier. Her ambitions had sunk gradually in the desiccating air of failure. But why had she failed? Was it her own fault or that of destiny? She remembered how her mother, after they had lost their money, used to say to her with a kind of vindictiveness, but you'll get it all back. You'll get it all back with your face. The, rem the remembrance roused a whole train of association. And she lay in the darkness, reconstructing the past out of which her present had grown. The Bart's style had been affluent, though always with an undercurrent of financial anxiety. Everything changed when Lily was 19. The previous year, she had made a dazzling debut fringed by a heavy thundercloud of bills. The light of the debut still lingered on the horizon, but the cloud had thickened, and suddenly it broke. Lily and her mother had been seated at the luncheon table, and Lily was feeling the pleasant languor which is youth's penalty for dancing until dawn. But her mother was as alert, determined, and high in color as if she had risen from an untroubled sleep. In the center of the table, a pyramid of American beauties lifted their vigorous stems. They held their heads as high as Mrs. Bart, but their rose color had turned to a dissipated purple. And Lily's sense of fitness was disturbed by their reappearance on the luncheon table. I really think, Mother, she said proposally, we might afford a few fresh flowers for luncheon, some, just some jonquils or lilies of the valley. Mrs. Bart stared. Her own fastidiousness had its eye fixed on the world. And she did not care how the luncheon table looked when there was no one present at it but the family. But she smiled at her daughter's innocence. Lilies of the Valley, she said, calmly cost two dollars a dozen at this season. Lily was not impressed. She knew very little of the value of money. It would not take more than six dozen to fill that bowl, she argued. <laughs> six dozen what? asked her father's voice in the doorway. The two women looked up in surprise. Though it was a Saturday, the sight of Mr. Bard at luncheon was an unwanted one. But neither his wife nor his daughter was sufficiently interested to ask an explanation. Mr. Dro Mr. Bart dropped into a chair. I was only saying, Lily began, that I hate to see faded flowers at luncheon, and Mother says a bunch of lilies of the valley would not cost more than $12. Mayn't I tell the florist to send a few every day? She leaned confidently toward her father. He seldom refused her anything. And Mrs. Bart had taught her to plead with him when her own entreaties failed. Mr. Bart sat motionless. Suddenly, he looked at his daughter and laughed. Twelve dollars, twelve dollars a day for flowers? Oh, certainly, my dear. Give him an order for twelve hundred. He continued to laugh. Mrs. Mark Bart gave him a quick glance. What is the matter, Hudson? Are you ill? Ill? No, I'm ruined. 